So artificial intelligence in its most pure form is um, a machine that can can actually do, is, is human. It, it, it reaches consciousness. Larry, welcome. Thanks for having me, Rob. Um, why is there so much interest this year in particular about AI? And, and probably why is, it, uh, why is it so scary? Because it seems to be changing so fast. So Rob, um, AI is an exponential technology, just like uh, quantum or synthetic biology. And after the pandemic, we all understand exponentials in a way that we never have before, this ability for things to grow virally. On themselves like that, yeah. Yeah, exponentially. And so, so basically you look at it one day and it's stupid, it's ridiculous, it can't do anything. So you ignore it and you turn away and you get back to the everyday life. You come back a week or two later, suddenly it's progressed. And by the time you realize that it's actually competing with you, for example, or it's actually working, by the time you realize that, it's way too late. It's gone way past you. And how is this different from computers that you 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 just you wrote programs for them and the program it, it, it do you think what's making it grow exponentially yeah so what, what's new about it sure so the so so it isn't it isn't new um you know machine learning predictive analytics have been around a long time I, I saw my first um intelligent agent about 10 years ago at Stanford um intelligent agents are a, a, a series of algorithms that are designed to replace the functionality or to replicate the functionality of a human so at Stanford 10 years ago, they had um, an intelligent agent accountant. And it could do all of the basic functions that a human accountant could do. And the idea was that um, if you could produce these capabilities, then you could truly sort of have a startup of one. You could have one human um, being the innovator, the ideas person, and a series of AIs or intelligent agents to replicate all the basic business functions. Now, that hasn't happened. Um, but we certainly have seen a transition to far more automation of basic business tasks. And this is part of why our productivity, the efficiency of innovation has increased, why we've gone through this amazing period of prosperity. So AI is um, supercharging what computers can do and growing upon itself, getting faster and faster what it's doing. Because one thing that shocked me was um, after I'd tried out ChatGP, which it's helpful. The <laughs> leaders in the field were saying, stop for six months until we get the rules right. In other words, people were very anxious about this. Why were they anxious? Yeah, because because chat GPT does have some human characteristics. So firstly, um, it is just a series of algorithms. That, that is a series of yeah. programs that, 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 that run. Yeah, there, there is no, according to the sort of most pure definition of artificial intelligence, we're not there yet. So artificial intelligence in its most pure form is um, a machine that can can actually do is, is human. It, it it reaches consciousness. We're not there, and I don't know how we could even know if we're there. Well, you, you'd know because the machine would start lying to you to advance itself. It would start oh, replicating see, bad uh, human human characters. So if it had consciousness, it would have in a sense a sense of self that could be evident in its behaviour. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, so so these algorithms, as powerful as they are, and also we've we've unleashed um, a deluge of data. You know, giving AI um, access to every bit of data on the planet means it can look backwards. It can look at every possible permutation of activity. Right. Yes, yes. It learns from looking backwards. And of course, that's its Achilles heel. Humans have this unique ability to create new thought, completely new to world innovation. AI can dramatically accelerate that, um, but it yeah. can't create an idea. So what was the fear then? What was the, what was the, what was the fear? Oh. And, th and these weren't... These weren't Luddites, these were people in the field. No, 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 no. So people, so, so you, you've got to be able to interrogate AI to assure yourself that its, um, its conclusion is accurate. Now, if you've used ChatGPT, you know that it will tell you more or less whatever you want it to tell you based on how you ask the question. For example, if you ask it um, about, you know, tell me the bad side of Larry Marshall, you would get Larry Marshall's a climate denier who presided over the decimation of Australia's national treasure, the CSIRO, and destroyed it. I know that because I, I asked that question. And you can ask it another way. Is, um, it, is it true, Larry? <laughs> well, um, let, me, let me give you an example. Um, when I took over CSIRO in 2015, it had been on 30 years of decline, yep. and the decline was accelerating, so it was in a bad place. Um, but many Australian businesses are in that place because, frankly, back then, Australia was at least a decade behind on its adoption of digital capability. So, so one of the questions I posed to the scientists, innovation is often about an uncomfortable truth. 
So, so what if AI could replace us? What if we could be replaced? Maybe, maybe we should try and replace ourselves to find out whether it's possible. Yes. Now, that's very scary to any human in any job. Oh, machine's going to replace me. So, but to their credit, the scientists tried to do it. And essentially what we said was um, the scientific method relies on a process where a genius scientist has a hypothesis um, about science. They know everything about a field of science, physics, chemistry, whatever. So they have a hypothesis and they do a series of experiments to test it. AI doesn't need a hypothesis. It just needs the data. So what about if we turn the scientific method upside down? Don't have an expert. Just go analyze all the world's data, combine it in every possible permutation and figure out you know, what your hypothesis should be from that. So that's astounding. So instead of having a thesis that's then tested, it creates as many theses as it can, quote, think of out of the data. The majority of which I'm sure is complete rubbish. Correct. But occasionally they'll hit on something that will be very important. Exactly. And, and, and when we did this, um, probably the, the, the greatest learning of, of this is um, it, it works okay. It works okay. And there are companies in the world that are using that approach, for example, to mine all of the data in the ocean to try to come up with a new pharmaceutical based on naturally occurring combinations. And, and it works, but it's not great. But if you put it together with a domain expert, so digital plus domain, AI that, plus domain. That is a person knows what it's about. That, that scientific guru can harness that power and channel it because the scientist knows oh, that, that's rubbish. They know, you know look, kill all that, but let's, let's go back over here. I hadn't thought about that before. And so when you watch the AI and the human, they actually form a collaborative bond. So and that generates amazing. I mean, it sounds like um, we're on the in beginning of a remarkable expansion of human innovation. Where it's going to go, we don't know, but of great benefit to human, humankind. Yeah. Oh, so, so why, therefore, does, does the, I try again. Why did those guys say stop? What are they worried about? Oh, yeah. So, so again, um, no, no, for, and, for, for good reason, because, um, so, so because AI learns by looking backwards, um, if, if we're not careful, it will replicate all of our mistakes. It will naturally assume that the human biases that we've had over the centuries are the way we are, and that's the way we like it, and therefore we should repeat them. Well, we don't want to do. We don't want to do that. We want to get. We want to get better from our past. So the AI is inherently conservative. Yeah. So, so think of it as a. Think of it as a child. Yeah. It, it's learning. It's in the early stages of learning. It's sort of rapidly approaching. You know, becoming a teenager. We all know how challenging teenagers can be as parents. But if we if we channel it right, if we teach it the best parts of ourselves, then we're far more likely to get a well balanced adult who will be a partner and a collaborator rather than you know the Terminator. Is AI a threat or a boon to a liberal society? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's both. Um, so, look, I think of... So, so, so we used AI and CSIRO to come up with a better market vision for Australia's future. And again, modelling... For Australia's future. Correct. Yeah, we, we, we threw it at a whole, at a whole nation. Um, because Australia is small in terms of population, so... There's only a small number of things that we could hope to be best in world at in terms of innovation. We also have a series of very unique problems. We're the driest continent on the planet. Um, so how do we harness our strengths to overcome our, our challenges based on what we think is going to happen going forward? So AI can combine all this history and it can try and project different scenarios for the future. And then humans can look at that and say, actually, that one could happen. And therefore, what would we need? Let's work backwards. How do we avoid that happening? And of course, the classic example, and this is what I like about capitalism. Um, for years, 20 years, um, cattle farmers got blamed for causing climate change. Bill Gates said, if cattle were a country, they'd be the third largest emitter on the planet. And poor cattle farmers can't fix that, right? It's not their fault, right? <laughs> we humans eat cows and cows produce methane. Yes. So um, we went out to the cattle industry they accepted us, despite the fact that many of our own scientists had been rubbishing them in the media for years. They accepted us and we said, hey, how can we help you? And so using a series of AI algorithms to model scenarios for genetic breeding, we came up with a way to make a food supplement for cattle that almost eliminated their emissions. Now, did the cattle industry resist that? No. They said, wow, if we can do that, and actually it's a little bit more beneficial for the cow as well, of course we'll embrace it. And that product, a unique Australian product, 
is now sold in Europe, the United States, and it's used widely in Australia because it solves an economic problem as well as a societal problem. And, and that's what science can do. It can and, solve that seemingly impossible problem. And you said cap you like capitalism because it enables this innovation. It, well, exactly. So if you want industry to be more sustainable, make sustainability profitable for industry and you'll get no argument from yes, industry. Yes. Rather, so rather, rather than using regulation as the, as, the, as, the, as the main lever. I know there's a room for regulation, it must be, as the main lever. Well, we, when I said good or bad, you said yes. <laughs> What's the yes to the bad? Um, so so if, if it's misused as it is, so for example, many of your cyber threats today are, are driven by um, basic AI algorithms that oh, can okay. mimic and learn human behavior. So to do phishing or spear phishing, um, AI can go online, it can learn everything it needs to know about you and it can craft an argument that is so convincing to you because it knows you that you'll go, oh, uh, maybe this is real, and it will it will trick you. And so, if you don't believe me, right, there's a there's a there's a little Aussie company called Curious Thing. Yes. It's that designed an AI to interview candidates, and this is for big companies where they might get ten or twenty thousand letters from people. It can call the the human, the candidate. It will do a series of interview questions to determine, to filter, should the company interview that yes, person. Yes, yes, It has a personality type engine. It has a lie detector in you know, it. And based on basic principles, it will isolate you out of the candidate pool. Now, that's a great efficiency tool for a business. But if it's designed by a bunch of 25-year-old white male engineers, then the risk is that if a African-American or um, uh, an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander does the test, it will think they're lying or it'll personality type them wrong because it doesn't understand their culture because it hasn't been designed. In other words, it hasn't got that broader that broader human ability to judge on a wider uh, theme of things because AI is about precision in a way. It's it's noughts and ones in, in the, at the end of the day, the computer. Whereas humans, I think, may think in other than simply that binary way about kind of things. So what you're saying is AI makes gives humans much more power. And because that means more power to solve the problem of methane emissions from cows and much more power for me to find out how to uh, rip money off other people. Exactly. So like all science and all technology, it's all about who's using it and what their objective is. So is this fair? The history of human. It's us. Exactly. In the history of innovation, that's probably the story, is it not? With the coming of the, the Industrial Revolution, good and bad, the coming of the... Uh, chemical revolution of the late 19th century, the coming of the electrical revolution. In a way, we should relax from it because all it's doing is making us stronger for good or evil. That, that's right. So Maybe we shouldn't relax it, that's the case. No, not relax, but, but we, we have to be vigilant. But, but yeah, John F. Kennedy um, was worried in the 60s. I think he said something like, you know, the greatest threat to our future is, is automation because it'll eat up all the labor force. Now, ironically, um, that automation and innovation actually drove an amazing period of prosperity for actually, United States. Actually, let's deal with that question because this is this is not the one of the evil AI. It's the AI will take all our jobs away. Mm. Um, in the past, this has often been worried about. P people broke loom machines in uh, mm -hmm. in in England, and the, and there is a fear. In the short term, I suspect it's true. People will lose jobs. In the long term, though, I don't think it is true. Am I right? Because the innovation will create new jobs and new situations. Yeah, ex exactly. In, in fact, the, the way I the way I sort of put it, um, so so as a you know, I did six companies. They were all in different markets, six startups. Um, but every sort of five years, I reinvented myself. So I started off as a scientist. Must have been exhausting. No, it was energizing. It was amazing. <laughs> it was it was so much fun because you know you're learning something new. And when you come into a new market as a human, um, your imagination, your knowledge, you're able to see the uncomfortable truths of that market that someone who might have been in it for 20 or 30 years can't see anymore. Yeah. And so you disrupt it. Um, that, that was my past, but I think it's everyone's future. We, we, we can't be an accountant for 20 or 30 years. We, we, we have to evolve. And, and these intelligent agents, they, they can replicate you know, a bookkeeper. But what that should mean, if, if the bookkeeper is willing to evolve, then, then their work will escalate. It will become more strategic. It will become higher value. Higher level 
than the detail, what was to me, to my mind, my Monday work of bookkeeping. Right. One of the most amazing examples I saw in, in CSIRO, we tried to transcend our structure and, and every company is limited by their structure, limited by their hierarchy. And innovation is all about, you know, unstructured, self-forming teams. We tried to harness um, AI, essentially predictive analytics and machine learning, to help the teams form, to find the right people to put on the project and forget about the structure of the organization. Now, it's very disruptive, but if you've heard of the holacracy, this is the no, structure that Zappos has. Right. Um, it feels like chaos. There are no managers. You know, everyone's a manager. Everyone, no, no one's got a single line of reporting. It's all, it breaks all of the basic rules of business. But Zappos is an amazingly efficient company because it, it uses this uncomfortable truth of, you know, you need a bit of chaos to have innovation. AI can help us manage that. Now, do we crack it at Sorrow? No, but we sure put a good dent in it. And I reckon over the next sort of five to 10 years, absolutely we'll crack it. I've no idea what a holistic company is. <laughs> um, so, so most companies have a pyramidal structure. Yes. They have bosses. a CEO and a board and so on, yeah. a report. Um, but the things that the people underneath that do are generally organized by, um, you know, by project or by customer. Yes, yes, or, yes. But, but they're stuck in silos. And, and Syro is very much like this. We're stuck in, you know, I'm a physicist, you're a chemical engineer, you're a digital person. Innovation happens when you bring them all together. But, but how do you do that seamlessly to work on a particular problem? And how do you manage that when maybe you've got one person who's working on six different projects how do you manage that? Very complicated. Very complicated. But the, the, the HR, when you, when you start to use an intelligent agent to manage the basic functions of HR, that HR human can then advance to figuring out that problem of how do you, how do you manage this chaos of a holacracy. So, age so, example. I won't, I won't go any further there. <laughs> Rather rabbit hole. <laughs> AI, you're saying, is going to enhance human capacity for good or ill. Let me ask about some of the... Um, what... Is it a danger for freedom in the sense it creates the power for a surveillance state? Oh, again, it makes nine ninety four where there was a corner. You may remember in in his room where the, where the he couldn't be seen. Make that impossible. Mm. So 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 using the data from the past, AI can make educated guesses about the future. It can't predict the future, but but it can it can predict what you're going to say or what you're going to write. And if you use your iPhone or your the latest version of Word, it, it, they have predictive text. I've noticed that. Yeah. Yes. And, and all it's doing is it, 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 it learns by the combination of words that you use in the past and others use it. It, 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 it kind of thinks, yeah, there's a 70% chance you're going to want to say this. And, and most of the time it's pretty right. So it is predicting your behavior in a way. Um, some things about human behavior can be predicted. Where we get into trouble is if we assume that we can get it 100% right. And if you've used ChatGPT, you know it will give you almost whatever answer you want, depending on how you ask the question. And I think the the, the, the genius of the human is that's thirty percent not predictable. Exactly. If I'd say so. Well, I, I'm writing, I write pieces, and I, I'm I, in fact I don't mind being helped along. I don't mind predictive text once it's finally because I'm a very bad speller. But uh, it's the thing you can't think of that makes the difference. Exactly. What kind of society should we be then in order to get the most out of AI? What what kind of um, look government and legal structure should there be? Yeah, so, so I think like all branches of science and technology, you know, we have, we have, Australia has very strict gene regulation technology. So in Australia, we use genetic engineering to breed strains of crops that are immune to climate change. So today, Australian wheat is actually a higher yield by about 30% than it should be because, because of the effects of climate okay. change. But Australian science got ahead of that. Um, and it bred strains that you know were immune to that. We're trying to do the same thing with corals to protect the barrier reef. So, so again, I can give you countless examples of the, the great outcomes of of using AI. But basically, if you're doing something like genetic engineering, you can either test millions of combinations, or you can have AI use its predictive analytics capability to do that for you, and then use a human to help it narrow in on the combinations that have the best chance of working. Just to put it in concrete terms, when we used to try and breed a strain of a crop, it might take seven years. With machine learning and predictive analytics, you can accelerate that. We think you might be able to do it in two years. And that's important because that saves yeah, yeah. years of work. My question is, some will attempt to regulate. Uh, 
there's always in society, there's the regulators and there's the in, in it, the freedomers. And um, classical liberalism wants to say that the onus must be on the regulator to justify it because overregulation can destroy or damage human um, innovation and self-organisation. Um, what do you think as, as a leader in this field is the kind of regulation or kind of structure that the society have in order to get the best out of the AI without the worst? Yeah, so so I, I was very proud of of um, Malcolm when he was prime minister because that terrible, yes, and that was one of his first things: is how do we come up with an ethics framework to govern AI without stifling it? And so he tasked CSIRO with that with that role: how do we create an AI framework? And we did it in collaboration with pretty much every digital group in the country. But it was basic principles like it it, it has to be it can't be a black box. And most AI is a black black box. Which means you I mean, can you have to be able to interrogate what it's going on inside. You have to be able to verify that it that it okay. that it's not telling you what it wants to tell you. That it's and and and, and the other 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 ones. Um, it doesn't. It's not. Bi- it doesn't have our inherent biases programmed into it. Right. I can tell you, as good a job as you think you do programming it, it's almost impossible for it not to inherit your biases as a human. I, I would have thought so. Actually, there's a sense in which we can't not be biased. We can't yeah. see. You. And it can't see the world as God sees it that way. And, and it must tell you the truth. And to, you know, if it's doing science, it has to give you scientific truth. And, and that's in a way the hardest one for AI, because you know there aren't many absolute truths, particularly in science. So, so how do you how do you get it to? Yes. What, what you want it to do is to tell you there's an eighty percent probability that this is right, and of the twenty percent where it could be wrong, here's where I think it might be wrong. So it has to be it, it has to be a very good human. It has to be an angel. <laughs> really tell you the truth about its flaws. Yes. It's been very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, you, you strike me as a massive optimist, or rather hopeful. It's not just a cheery personality. You have great hope for the future uh, that this human innovation will have for our for our planet and for our race. You are optimist. I, I, I am, um, but, but I'm an innovator. And yeah, okay. I've never worked in government in my life until sorrow. And, and and I do see this collision between innovation and regulation. Okay. And they've got to figure out a way to coexist because, you know, government policy can set a target, but the only thing that can deliver the target is innovation, particularly in the case of, say, climate change. Wouldn't matter what speech a politician gave. The only way you're going to get to net zero. You can't, you can't pass a law <laughs> to make things better. Right. You've got to pass a law of a framework in which people can innovate to make things. Yeah, so so governments can provide a framework of rules, and then it's up to innovators and capitalists to figure out how to use that to actually create economic value and create jobs. Yeah. Because without jobs, we don't have a society. Larry, thank you very much. My pleasure. This is Liberty in Question. I've been speaking uh, with Larry Marshall, or or have I?